Hi there, my friend and friends. I always enjoy when people complain that there's too many ways to do something in CSS, but they seem perfectly happy when we can do the same thing multiple ways in JavaScript. But of course, whenever we end up with multiple ways to do the same thing, it's usually because one is better in a specific situation over one of our other options. One example of this in JavaScript is that there's a bunch of different ways to create functions. And today I brought Chris Ferdinand and Andy with me to help break them down because as well as I know CSS, he knows his way around JavaScript. Thank you for joining me today, Chris. And yeah, what, why are there so many ways to make different functions in JavaScript? Kevin, thanks so much for having me. I don't know why there's so many ways. I know why there's at least two different ways. I do not know for the life of me why there's three. Um, so <laughs> let's talk about it. So um, I'm going to start with the OG ways to declare functions, and then we'll get into like the new way. I use new in quotes because it's been around for a while now. It still kind of irks me, but I'm also an old man who yells at the clouds. <laughs> so um, like the original old school way to declare functions, function declarations, is to use the function operator or keyword followed by the function name. Uh, and then you've got your parentheses with any sort of variables or um, parameters that are being declared on the function and then your curly brackets. And then inside those curly brackets is where the stuff happens. So in this case, I'm taking two numbers, I'm adding them together and I'm returning the result. And I could do something like add three and four and it's going to return seven. Um, there's also a function expression where you have a function, usually anonymous, but I have sometimes seen people do things where they like, they create a named function and then also assign it to a variable. I don't know why you would do this, but I do sometimes see it done. And so here I've got an anonymous function that then gets assigned to the add variable. And so I can do the exact same thing here. I've got my two numbers, uh, they get added together and returned, and I could do something like add three and four, and I'm gonna get back seven. The question around these is always, why would you favor one versus the other? For the most part, they work exactly the same, except with one weirdish little kind of gotcha ed edge case around something called hoisting. So um, when the browser runs, so actually let me, let me start with this. So here I've got an add function and a subtract function uh, and I'm declaring them with function declarations or I'm, I'm creating them as a function declaration. I can run the add function after, after I've declared it or I can run the subtract function before I've declared it. When the browser loads a JavaScript file, it's not like HTML where it just kind of instantly starts doing all the things or even CSS where it starts painting all the things. Because JavaScript is a scripting language, the browser actually reads through the whole thing first to understand all the different pieces. And then it goes through it again and runs it top to bottom. Um, when it does that first read through, it does this thing called hoisting. It doesn't actually move anything around in the file, but it already knows there's a function called add, and this is what it does. So, uh, and in this case, there's a function called subtract, and I know what it does. So that's the reason why this works. Even though I haven't said what subtract does here, the browser runs it just fine because it's done a read through. It already knows, okay, there's a function called subtract, and it does a thing. Um, and I know what that thing is, so I can, I can just do it. But when you use function expressions, it actually works a little bit differently. So because I have a variable that is being assigned an anonymous function, the browser doesn't hoist the function that's assigned to the variable um, or uh, true for any variable. So I could have a bunch of variables that were just other things, right? So let name equal Chris, for example. When the browser does its first pass, it knows there's a variable called name. It does not have a value for that yet. It hasn't executed the code, so it hasn't assigned any sort of value to that variable yet. And so as a result, when we try to declare a function with a function expression and then run it before we've expressed it, we get an uncaught reference error, um, cannot access subtract before initialization. So in this case, what's happening is the browser knows there's a variable called subtract. It has no idea that it's a function, could be a string, could be something. It just knows the variable exists. So then when it goes to actually run the code, it hits this and it's like, I don't know what to do here yet. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if I do it this way, 
it works as you would expect. Um, and so you're not often in a situation where you're trying to run code before you've declared it. But I do sometimes see people who like to organize their code where they have all of the stuff that runs up at the top and then all of the kind of the declarations of those things down below it. And so if you mm -hmm. like to structure your code that way, you have to use a function declaration. You cannot use a function expression or you're going to run into errors. I personally tend to favor function declarations, but aside from the hoisting thing, it is entirely a matter of personal preference. That's that. Before I move on, uh, this is actually relevant to when we start to talk about arrow functions, but any questions there, Kevin? You know, hoisting seems, well, I know there's a bit more to it than, mm -hmm. than just that, but it, you know, I think at, at its base level, it's a pretty easy way to understand what's going on there. Um, yeah. And yeah, it makes sense. And I think we've all seen that, that error that you've, you've shown in there. Um, the one question I'd actually would have is it's mm -hmm. a little bit off topic maybe, but you were just talking sure. about the different ways to organize the code, uh, where some people like to have, you said everything going on and then mm -hmm. the, the functions declared lower down. Do you have a preference one way or the other for that? I do. Yeah. So I, um, if you look at my code, uh, I almost always have them set up where I've got my variables up at the top. And then in the middle, I've got my like methods and functions. So mm -hmm. anything that sets up what's supposed to run. And then down at the end, I've got my initializations and event listeners. Um, and so if my code is really big, I'll sometimes even set it up like this. Right. But so I might have something like, uh, you know, let name equal Chris. And then I have, um, you know, my functions. So say hello. And this is going to do something stupid. Like, um, it's going to console log. Hello. Hello name. And then down at the very end, I'm actually going to run that code. So right. this is a really common, common structure in my code bases. Usually they're not big enough that I need these headings here, but I have on occasion, if I've got like really large code bases, it's nice to have these, these physical breaks. So you can see how things work. Um, but this is often how my code code works. Or if I'm like getting elements, right. If I'm going to set up a, an event listener of some, some kind, um, I'll have my, you know, my thing up here where I'm getting, let's say I'm getting my form and then down here, I'm, um, I'm adding an event listener. Uh, it would help if I could type, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I'm listening for the submit event and then I'm going to have some sort of like handler for that. That'll get declared up, up over here. So you'll see this a lot in, in my code. I want to stress, this is a personal preference. There are so many different ways to do this and none of them are inherently right or wrong. It's just, you know, what, what feels most natural and, and readable to you. Um, mm -hmm. and if you're working on a team, I'd say stick with team conventions, but if you're doing solo projects, just pick the thing that's easiest for you to reason about and maintain in the long run. So that brings us to arrow functions. Arrow functions came about as a way to address some of the idiosyncrasies of traditional functions and also give them a potentially terser syntax depending on your use case. We'll talk about some of that, but first let's just talk about the general way of writing them. So um, if I have a traditional function here, so I've got my, my original add function as a function expression, the arrow function version, you drop the function keyword and drop a fat arrow between the parentheses and the curly brackets or curly braces. Otherwise, you can keep it exactly the same. So the difference between a function expression and an arrow function is, is just, I remove the word function, I add this, this little arrow thing here. Um, there's more to it than that, but that's you know kind of at a high level. Um, the thing about arrow functions, if you want them to be named, you cannot write them as a function declaration. There's no way to do like, uh, like this, that, just, that doesn't exist. Uh, so it has, to, it has to be a function expression. So again, be mindful of hoisting. In that case, it's a reason why we talked about that. But there is also a way to write this in a more abridged syntax. If you have an arrow function that is only returning things, you can um, you can drop the curly brackets altogether, and it'll still work. So in this case, this is going to give me the same exact result as this did. And this is where a lot of folks start to really like arrow functions because you can keep them really compactly on just one line. The one big advantage of arrow functions is um, they do not override the this keyword in JavaScript. And so this is where developers start to really love them. This is confusing as, as heck. Um, it's, it's, it's a keyword whose 
definition or the, the thing that's assigned to it changes depending on where it's invoked. But it's used heavily in JavaScript classes. And forgive me, Kevin, because I know I'm probably getting way too into the weeds, but this is the best way I could think of to kind of explain this concept here. Yeah, no, it's so all good. I've got this JavaScript class that I can use to create a new instance of a thing and then run some methods on it. So in this case, I've got this calculator, I pass in some sort of base number, and then I can run the add method on it. So here I'm going to add five to 42, and the new value of count will be 47. Uh, I promise I'm, I'm terrible at math. <laughs> <laughs> so the way this works in the class, I've got this thing called a constructor. This sets up the instance, um, and I'm assigning a, a total to the instance, to this, with whatever my start value was. In this case, it's zero by default, or if you pass something in, it's that number. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've got this add method here where I am accepting any number of numbers and then as an array, and I'm going to loop through them, or it turns them into an array, I should say. Uh, and then I'm going to loop through each one and add them to my total. Mm -hmm. um, the problem here is inside this function, this no longer refers to the same thing as here. So if we were to jump over to the browser and take a look at this, I've got this error here, cannot read property of undefined when trying to read total. Um, we can actually, we can see this in action. So if I, if I console log this, um, we get just this undefined thing. This doesn't even exist inside this function. Whereas if I were to log it here inside add, uh, it refers to my calculator instance with the total of 42. Um, so one of the ways that developers historically would try to get around this is they would assign this to some other variable and then use that inside the function instead. I'm using instance here, but you used to see let that equal this all the time yeah. back in like the jQuery era. Um, just all of our code, let that equal this. It was so confusing. I never had any idea what was going on. But if I jump over to the browser, you can see now it works. Now we get 47. Uh, you know, the, the, the expected number. Arrow functions prevent you from having to do let that equal this or let instance equal this. Um, so in an arrow function, this does not get adjusted at all. So whatever it was in the, the parent scope, it is inside the arrow function. So now mm -hmm. instead of having to, to let instance equals this and instance total, I can just say this total plus equals number and it will add it. And so if we jump over to the browser and reload, I still get 47. Uh, and this is where, in my opinion, the real value of arrow functions starts to come in. When you start doing things like working with classes and prototypes, and you need to preserve this for some reason, that's where they really win. Um, one other thing you can see I'm doing here, because there is only one argument, I don't even have to have the parentheses here. I can mm -hmm. just drop them entirely. And so you'll... Um, Actually, even now that I think about it, these curly brackets are optional as well. So I could do something like um, like this. And uh, this, here, actually, let's, let's reload it. I'm still getting 47. So this is for developers who like terse code, and I am not one of them. I like verbose code because I, I think it's easier to read. Um, but if you're someone who really likes super short code and code golf, um, <laughs> arrow functions are also a boon in that regard because they allow you to keep things much smaller. Um, mm -hmm. Here, this, this multi-line thing becomes just a single line of code. That's the different ways to write functions. If we want to get into which one should you use and when, again, personal preference. So I know a lot of newer developers tend to use arrow functions for literally everything. Uh, I think it's what they teach in a lot of like school programs and boot camps and stuff now. Um, I'm old, so I tend to use function declarations for everything, except when there's some beneficial reason to use arrow functions. So I'll use arrow functions inside like classes and web components. But um, other than that, it's function declarations for me. And if you'd like to continue learning some JavaScript from Chris, I've put a link down in the description that goes over to his site. He's put together a special page for people who've watched this video that has the source code from everything that we've looked at today and also a whole bunch of articles and other things that you might find helpful. Thank you very much for watching. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome.